wonderful, my friends. This is the Sea of Galilee as seen from Mount Arbel. You can actually see me on that little picture. That guy standing and overlooking would be myself. This is a very, very, very nice day. And one with sharp eyes can also see the snowy cap of Mount Hermon, which in a different lecture I will try to submit to you is the mountain of transfiguration. Guys, the entire land of the gospel takes place on a nine mile strip. 70% of the gospel will take place. And uh, let's start seeing the various villages in this landmass. And you will all know them instantly. And even though you may have never been, if you are a Christian, Truly, this is your spiritual homeland, and you've been here many a times. And let's move a little bit more, and we will start examining the land of the gospel on this virtual tour from the west side, which is that white arrow representing Magdala. And we're going to travel nine miles on the northeastern seaboard all the way to Bethsaida, birthplace to St. Peter and St. Andrew. My friends, did you ever notice that Tiberius is physically the most dominant residency around the Sea of Galilee today? This would also be true 2,000 years ago. And yet, it is almost completely and utterly neglected by the biblical author. I submit to you there is no coincidence. There's a very, very good reason for it. And let's proceed to our first visitation, Magdala. And Magdala is birthplace to Mary Magdalene discovered completely and utterly by accident in 2006. This imagery is from 2015. It is quite different there today. And uh, let's proceed, let's proceed. My friends, this, before we proceed, this building, the same building that we saw before, is the synagogue of Magdala in the first century. This is one of the only two buildings in creation. We know for sure Jesus Christ in his physical form was in this building on a regular basis. There are only two such buildings on the face of the planet. We can say this with a hundred percent certainty, both of which are in Galilee. Let's, uh, let's uh, visit the building. My friends, notice the mosaic arts, and notice this is classic, very traditional Jew for this time frame. Notice the complete and utter absence of any imagery. In a later date, post the ministry of Jesus Christ, the Roman influence will greatly influence the Jewish culture, which is living subjugated to the Roman Empire. This is a Chesmonean town established by the followers of Judah Maccabee in the first century before Christ. On this synagogue, Jesus Christ lectures and preaches and delivers sermon on a very, very regular basis in this very building. Please notice how small and modest this is, really is. Very intimate as well. The teachings which Jesus Christ teaches in these country towns will later be codexed into the document we call New Testament today. But the oral traditions are written down only post-crucifixion. 
Guys, let's also pay special attention to the stone in the middle, which is called the Magdala Stone, and let's proceed with the slideshow. And ladies and gents, if there's any questions in any given moment, please write them down, and Ophir will read them out so I can address them as you have. My friends, please note that today, when you enter a synagogue or a church, people sit in rows. Please note that in a first century synagogue, the people and the congregation sit in an egalitarian fashion. And the sermon is delivered from the centerpiece that you see over there. It's not a temple. Very good question, by the way. My friends, this is not a temple. This is a synagogue. And the North American Jewry have a, a bit of a Hebrew lingui linguistic issue. Jews have one temple in Jerusalem in this time frame, the Grand Temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Everything else is a synagogue. Today, the Jews do not have a single temple. They only have synagogue. The temple in the Hebrew language is Bet HaMikdash, house which is holy. And a synagogue in the Hebrew language, Bet Knesset, house we convene in. And this is 100%, 100%, there's no shadow of a doubt, this is the synagogue of this township of Magdala to which Jesus Christ ministered in this time frame. It's a 100% idea. Yes, sir. Or ma'am, I don't know who asked the question. Please proceed up here with the next slide. Wonderful. My friends, the synagogue itself is a classic. And there has been more discoveries there, which are not in the slideshow. I should update it once I can leave my house, I guess. But let's look at the centerpiece. And let's play a game. And I'm going to describe to you what we're seeing. And please tell me which very famous Jewish holiday is going to come to mind. Please notice the symbol of the menorah in the centerpiece. It's a seven candle menorah, not to be confused with the Hanukkah, which is an, the item we celebrate Hanukkah today with. The seven candle menorah can only exist in the temple in Jerusalem, and it existed in the tabernacle in the temple in the desert before there was a temple in Jerusalem. Please note two pictures of oil on both sides of the centerpiece of the menorah. And please notice the two pillars. And there's an expression in the English language until this very day, the two pillars of the faith, which stems from the two pillars that were in the front of the temple in Jerusalem. Folks, which Jewish holiday is all of this symbolism reminiscent of. Hanukkah and the offers of the town and the offer of this model and the residents of the synagogue of this congregation are all Chesmonian or Maccabean loyalists. And Hanukkah is the celebration of the victory of the Maccabean or Hasmonean dynasty over the Hellenistic Empire. So this Galilean did a very, very, very patriotic thing for his time frame. And the symbolism here tells us the 1776 or 1948 of this political entity, the second Jewish kingdom. And let's see the next slide. And please note, on the side of the model, you can see a pomegranate. And in the Jewish faith, a pomegranate with its exterior, this red, very, very heavily seated exterior, is a symbol for abundance, for fertility, and for the temple in Jerusalem. 
So we see another clue right over here on the side of the model. And please continue. You can see the date trees over here, right over here on the side in each one of these little niches. And please remember, this is not a professional artist that created this model prior to 68 AD. The person who did this prior to 68 AD is a country boy. It's a country boy who went to his pilgrimage in Jerusalem. He was so impressed with what he saw over there that he paid homage to the temple in Jerusalem in the synagogue in his own town, Magdala. And let's see the next slide. And the next slide. Please notice the symbol over here. You can notice both the pomegranate symbol and a date tree symbol. Let's continue. Wonderful. This is from the top side of it, and it's under a glass uh, protection. And it's also not the original, it's an exact replica because the original has no price tag. The symbol in the middle is called a rosetta. And the symbol in the middle has meaning. Unfortunately, no one knows in our day and age what this meaning is. What we know very clearly is that date trees on both sides always, always, and forever and through all time, including our time, a symbol for the Holy Land. And let's continue. And there's a lot of information in coins. And one of my teachers actually has his PhD in coins. And hopefully, one day when you come to the Holy Land, we will open up all the information we can get from coins physically. Um, but we will forgo it on this particular occasion. And uh, let's continue to the next slide. Wonderful, and this is exactly what I was waiting for. Guys, I have no idea what is the name of this artist. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, his last name was not Cohen. In this time frame, and this is one of the great contributions to, of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people, is Jews didn't really pray at the time. And the common people never entered the tabernacle of the temple, ever. Jews had a fairly unpleasant caste system of Cohen, Levi, Congregation of Israel, Samaritan, which Jesus Christ constantly attacks this caste system both in the fable of the Good Samaritan, in the ceremony of communion, which he deprived from a Jewish Shabbat service. And he was very, 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 very 100% against this caste system. And eventually the caste system did get abolished when the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD. I can tell you for a fact, 100%, that this model comes from prior to 68 AD because the village of Magdala is completely and utterly destroyed in 68 AD by the Roman Empire, two years prior to the destruction of the temple. And today the temple is destroyed, Magdala is destroyed, and by a very very, very divine intervention, if you will, or chance, the only model in the world from this time frame survived, and there's a lot of information we can get from this, and I have time only for a small amount, but the top 10% of it. Hey guys, please notice that the imagery of the tabernacle of the temple really changed, everything really changed from an artistic point of view, which is to say our anonymous artist 
went to Jerusalem prior to 68 AD. He saw the temple with his own eyes. He paid homage to it, homage to it, with his very limited artistic ability. And he tried to describe with his hands what he saw with his eyes. And yet, when he is addressing the tabernacle, everything changes because the artist who is not a Kohen, he is not a priest, never entered. He went to one of the Kohens and said, Mr. Cohen, sir, I am doing something nice and patriotic for my synagogue back in my hometown. Please describe to me what is it that you feel when you are in the inner sanctum of the temple? Myself and my professor, Professor Najad al -Khan, look at this imagery, and it looks like a wheel of a chariot. And you can see something that looks very reminiscent of a fire. We know for a fact that there is a ever-burning fire in the inner sanctum of the temple. And we also know that the imagery for the presence of God and the most common imagery will be from Ezekiel, the chariot of fire, or Elijah being ascending to the heaven in a chariot of fire. And we believe this is the message that the anonymous artist got from the priest prior to 68 AD. And he is now describing something which he never saw with his eyes. He only heard a very abstract explanation with his ears. Let's continue, Ophir. My friends, one of the visitations in the Sea of Galilee is an ancient boat discovered in 86 by the Lupin brothers. This particular mosaic is much later, it's fifth century, but the, we now know for a fact and scientifically that boating technology in the Galilee really didn't change between the first and the fifth century. The design of the boat is still identical. Let's continue. The church that was built there in Magdala, very, very impressive. They now own a hotel, a very impressive hotel. And many, many tour groups I was supposed to escort this year to Israel have canceled their stay in the hotel. And this is life. What can we do? It's a nice hotel, and I'm praying and hoping it will do well in the future. In this particular case, we're seeing the nave of the church, which is there. And you can see that the church official did a very attractive, in my opinion, optical illusion, reminiscing about the many sermons Christ gave from both sides. And remember the scripture teaching us of Jesus Christ hopping from place to place on a boat, preaching from a boat, these boats are very slow, and the whole holy ark of the land of the gospel is only nine miles. Jesus walking afoot with a throng following him is a very feasible thing according to the geography. And let's continue. And speaking of the boat, the old boat discovered by Yuval and Moshe Lupin, I know them both personally on a first name basis. As we Galileans are so few, we all know each other on a first name basis. This is very worthwhile and let's, let's go into an in, inner depth view of this boat. My friends, the boat itself is a miracle. I cannot promise you not 100% that Jesus Christ was physically on this boat. I believe it, but it's a 99.9999% sure thing, rather than 100% like the synagogue of Magdala. Let's go in for a deeper look. The boat itself survives in the mud, and it's made of wood. It doesn't get composed in muddy water for two millennia. 
which there is no reasonable explanation for that as well. And let's go in for a deeper look. The boat itself, believe it or not, is in service for many, many, many decades. The boat itself exhibits a pattern of behavior of a lower class community, which means the boat originally was made out of cedar, and cedar is a very, very exp expensive substance. It's hard to come by. Notice what a big deal the Bible makes about Hiram, the king of Tyria, providing Solomon with cedar for the temple in Jerusalem. The orange in this imagery represents the cedar component. You can see that the boat has been patched over and over and over again on its many decades of service, and the decades of service include the exact time frame the ministry would happen in these parts. Please note that there is no uniformity whatsoever between the different renovations and patching, which is the boat is fixed with whatever is available or affordable at a given moment. The two communities this boat can be com coming from will be Magdala, which is in our world, world, we'll call it a upper middle class community, and Capernaum, which in our world is something we will call a trailer park. The boat very clearly exhibits a pattern of the behavior of less affluent people. If my thesis is true, and these boats are very expensive, there is only so many of them in the village of Capernaum, which means Jesus Christ in his ministry, which is very close with the fisherman community over there, the chances he is physically on the boat are quite high. Let's continue to the next slide. The items which are found on the boat, the nails, you can see them on the right hand side, the technology is a Roman iron nail technology. This is the same type and the same technology of the nails that will be used in the crucifixion in Jerusalem. Same time frame, everything is a 100% match here. Please notice the lunchbox. Today, people bring their plastic lunchbox to lunch. This is a 2,000 year old lunchbox made of clay. And I myself was a sailor on the Sea of Galilee for many years when I was a younger man. We always bring our lunch with us. You go on the boat, you have absolutely no idea when you get off the boat and you can get some food. You don't bring your lunch with you, you are not worth your salt as a sailor. The most interesting item found physically on the boat will be the little lamp on the left hand side. Why is this interesting and important to me? Because the owner of the boat is a Shomer Shabbos Jew. It's a Jew which is observant of the Shabbat. And when I examine the geopolitics of the Sea of Galilee during the time frame, the only Jews that are Shomer Shabbos are the ones living between Magdala and Bethsaida, the land of the gospel the Jews Christ ministers to. The city of Tiberias will be a modern city. It's only established in 18 AD by Herod and Trippus the same guy who beheaded John the Baptist. And this is why the city is never mentioned in the scripture. And Christ never ministered to them. And the Jews over there, and let's go to the next slide. Bill. Wonderful. The Jews over there in Tiberias are less observant. And these are Jews who embrace Roman culture instead of Judaism, and this is what the House of Herod, this is the society they're trying to create. On the east side and on the south side 
are the pagan cities of Hippos and Gadara. They are Greek Roman people. Surely they will not observe the Shabbos. And let's continue to the next slide. Which means we have evidence that the owner of the boat matches the description of what I expect from the disciples in the community. The two brothers who discovered the boat, that is my eighth in the sleeve, but I cannot prove this scientifically, and I will tell you all about it in person. My friends, this is the so-called Mountain of Beatitudes, which is surely not the Mountain of Beatitudes. And it is the Mountain of Beatitudes since 1928, when Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy, decreed it is the Mountain of Beatitudes. I submit to you, of, after examining both the scripture, the geography, and the archaeology, close but no cigar, and I can physically prove it in the field over there in the gallery. And let's uh, observe the wonderful view, by the way. The view from the not Mount of Beatitudes is superb. You cannot compete with it. Let's see the land of the gospel from all of its angles. And this is why Benito Mussolini chose that location. Please, uh, let's, let's see the, the views. The land of the gospel from the east side. We can make out Capernaum, and in the next couple of slides, of here you can just slide in. You will see I made all sorts of circles and such to locate exactly where the villages are. Wonderful, wonderful. Of here, don't don't move. Let's. I just want to talk about this for a little, little bit. This is the pagan city of Hippos, which I have been excavating physically and personally with my own hands since 2007. And you are more than welcome to look us up online, the Hippos Excavation Project, Haifa University Israel and Concordia St. Paul out of Minnesota. I believe very close to you if you are residents of Wisconsin. The city has 3,000 Greek Romans. This is where the madman of the Gadarene will be from, 100% sure. These guys are Greek Roman. They can raise pork. There's no problem there for them. And why am I emphasizing this? And why is this very important for me and interesting for me? This is a city on top of a mountain, which is the closing statement of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the Mount Sinai, if you will, of the new faith. And in my many, many years of excavating the city, I constantly find the white plaster that the city wall was plastered with in the first century. Today, uh, it barely survives on the wall, but in the first century, you need to imagine the geography of the Sea of Galilee which means the city on top of a mountain is exactly on the east side of it. And the vessel of the ministry live in the northwest side, predominantly of the Sea of Galilee, which means for their little Galilean world, which revolves around the Sea of Galilee, every single night of their existence, the sun sets in the west over Tiberius, reflecting very powerfully from a city on top of a mountain which cannot be hidden. And this is what, one of the ways I used to triangulate where my thesis to the Sermon of the Mount is and why Benito is close yet no cigar. In the field, this will make a lot of sense. And let's continue with it. the west side of the Sea of Galilee, you can see Tiberius, okay? And see how dominant it is. And up here you'll slide and uh, you'll, the things will just pop up on the screen. Wonderful. Ah, uh, no, no, just let's go one back. 
And look at Tiberius. Look at it. Look at it. It's massive. If you are from the Galilee, you're either from the city of Tiberius or you're a farmer. We don't have any in-betweens. Which means one cannot fully understand the scripture by reading the scripture at home in the United States. And a visit to the Holy Land means the scripture itself will be connected with geography, with the geopolitics of the times in which the scripture addresses, with the general history, with the non-biblical points of reference with the scripture. Which means, yes, I address the Bible as my history book, but today I can also look at the different people who wrote about the time frame and didn't make the cut to the Bible. Hopefully, a visit to the Holy Land means you will start reading your Bible, not only in what is written in the Bible, you will start reading to, in between the line in what's not written in the Bible, which for me is a historian slash archaeologist is equally important and interesting. Let's continue. Tabha, the place of the feeding of the multitude, and the slope you see, which is behind the church, I will submit to you and prove it to you, both scripturally and archaeologically, in the field that the sermon would happen on the slope rather than on the top of the mountain, as Benito claims. And let's continue. The church of the feeding of the multitude, and surely Christ would not send the entire congregation of 5,000 Galileans, men and women and children and pregnant ladies and toddlers and old people and crippled people, all the way up the mountain, preach to them. And these guys live in the lakeshore communities, except for Chorazin, but most of them come from the lakeshore. He would not march them all the way up the mountain. My drill sergeant, the army would, but Christ is a Messiah and not a drill sarge. Then march everyone down for the miraculous feed. Surely he wouldn't do it. Also, had he done it, as Benito claims, how can he go by himself to a high mountain to pray, which doesn't exist if Benito already possessed the highest mountain in the region for his version of these events? There's also a much older church from the 4th century, which really cements this line of thinking. Let's go and examine this church. It's very interesting. Interesting because of the 4th century mosaic. So if you look at the layer, which is black basalt, this is the 4th century Greek Orthodox Church. And if you look at the white building, this is the modern church from the 1970s, which is Roman Catholic, which is built over the 4th century Roman church. Guys, let's look at the mosaic art. And can you see ducks sitting on water lilies? And I've been a Galilee in my entire life, and I never saw a duck or a water lily in the Sea of Galilee, ever. Not a single time, ever. Guys, can you see the firebird fighting a snake on the low end of the mosaic art? And I've been a Galilee in my entire life, and I never saw a firebird fighting a snake in the Galilee. Not ever. Guys, can you see the kind of like bambooish growth here? This is something called gome which is very, very, very common for the River Nile in Egypt. And the little ark that carried Moses down the Nile was made out of this plant. This plant doesn't exist in the Sea of Galilee. And let's continue to the next slide. The small triangular building is called a nilometer. And this is an instrument which measures the annual flooding of the delta of the Nile in the Roman Empire, Greek and later Hellenistic and later Roman Empire. Let's continue. A 
stork we do see in the Sea of Galilee, but not that common. You can see more water lilies and more unnative animals. And you can very clearly see an undisputable nylometer with charters in Greek letters. Now, guys, this is a bit of a trick and the story of the feeding of the multitude is a spiritual story to tell us of the abundance of spiritual blessing to be found in Jesus Christ. I don't think that story that happens in the Sea of Galilee was about making money. The people who commissioned the artwork in this church in the 4th century is a recently converted to Christianity Roman Empire. And I think this nuance was a little lost on them. And if you remember the issue with the Coca-Cola commercial that happened back in the day, when they put a subliminal message to the people when they were going to the movies and there was one frame out of 24 per second, which was a Coca-Cola bottle, a cold one, and then everyone ran out of the cinema and bought a Coca-Cola. This is a little similar to this. Because what the Roman Emperor wants in this case is when the people come to pray for spiritual abundance in the place of the feeding of the multitude, he wants them to see the imagery of the Nilometer and the river Nile in front of their eyes. A Galilean, an average Galilean, wouldn't even know what animals exist in the Nile or what plants. He would never go there. Galileans don't stray far from the Galilee. It's not in their nature. The disciples did, but they obviously encountered someone which was supernatural. Let's continue. And with all of this Roman imagery, you see there's a small, small, small little mosaic of two little fish and five loaves of bread, but it's really not what this, the artwork in the church is about. Let's continue. Capernaum, HQ, this is my mission, to bring as many Christian souls to the birthplace of Christianity. And if you call yourself a Christian, this is ground zero. There are several highlights to a Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And the Golgotha or Calvary in Jerusalem is definitely one of them. But in Capernaum, we celebrate the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Let's uh, enter the town of Jesus. Let's enter the town of Jesus. My friends, this is it. For the purpose of our archaeological inquiry, let's observe Capernaum neighborhood A for the purpose of our inquiry. Please note that Capernaum is made out of basalt, which the, is the indigenous stone. And please note that the level of stonemasonry in Capernaum is virtually non-existence, which means the people of Capernaum in the, in the first century have very little in the way of monetary means, very little in technology. These people live in the New Testament time, but with an Old Testament level of technology and quality of living. Whether people living in Tiberias have running waters, theaters, medicine, you name it, they will have it. Let's examine more of Capernaum. Capernaum Neighborhood B. Please note that in Capernaum Neighborhood B, you can see these round things that are here in abundance. Capernaum Neighborhood A was a residential neighborhood. Capernaum Neighborhood B is still the same level of technology, using the same building material created by the same civilization in the same time, which is the first century before Christ, which means 
this is the layer of Capernaum Jesus Christ would spend his time during his ministry. In this particular case, this is the Foda or uh, Prudus processing area of the village of Capernaum. And these are grinders for wheat and barley. But this is a one-man show. This is not a commercial means of production. Also, there is absolutely no marketplace to be found anywhere in Capernaum, which means these people scratched a meager living from fishing and farming. There is no other type of individual in Capernaum at this time. But the retailers were in Magdala, a much better option. Why does Christ wish to reside in Capernaum rather than Magdala, which he would have been welcome, is obviously very important and interesting in its own right, and we will address it in the field as we are short on time. Let's continue. Guys, notice this building. This building is completely different. It's white rather than the black basalt. It's much superior in its quality. And the sign over there claims it's the synagogue of Capernaum, the one Christ would resurrect, the daughter of Jairus, etc. Archaeologically, this could not possibly be true. This is a post Nicene convention. It's a early Roman church building over first century Capernaum in the fourth century. The technology and the building material is completely and utterly different. Let's continue. Ah, very interesting. Very interesting. The inscription here is fourth century, but it's in Aramaic, which I can read. And Ophir, let's click another one and I'll emphasize what's interesting for us in this. Let's click another one. L remember well, Bar Zabadai, sons of Zabadai, when you sit and eat your bread. If you are a Christian, this is pretty awesome because people you know from Scripture just said hi to you from many thousands of years ago. And there are two sons of Zebedai, James and John. These two left Capernaum. But other members of the household of Zebedai continued to live in Capernaum for centuries after the event of Scripture just continued to have a normal life. They went to the sea, they fished, they went home, they went to the sea, they fished, they had kids who did the same, and we now have evidence that the house of Zebedai continues to exist in Capernaum for centuries after the events of Scripture and the two famous members of the household left the village. And I, li I like to call it, someone said hi. It's a blast from the past. Let's continue. The diagram of the 4th century Roman synagogue, or not even synagogue, it's more of a pilgrimage attraction, if you will, over, which is built over the 1st century Jewish synagogue, the one Christ ministered in, which is underneath the 4th century building. And let's continue. The diagram over here shows you, you can see in the little uh, corner of the diagram where the much smaller black basalt, like the rest of 1st century Capernaum, with very rudimentary level of technology is built, rather than this beautiful, perfect Roman building. But the event of scriptures were far from perfect. We can read it. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. Christ knew who, he, who he's talking to. 
Master, we have toiled all night, yet we had caught nothing. And you have this reoccurring theme of poverty in all of the Capernaum books. Masters, the tax collectors are coming. I don't know how I'm going to pay him. I'm going to need a miraculous fish coming out with some money in its mouth, which this species of fish actually does to this very day. It collects objects and put them in the mouth. And let's continue. Wonderful. And this is why we should come to Capernaum. This is, with very high level of certainty, the home where Jesus Christ resided. In this case, the level of technology, as you can see, is on the lowest level, first century, classic, rudimentary, black basil, barely any stonemasonry. Effectively, someone taking rocks from the nearby fields, piling it on one another and calling it a home. In this case, as opposed to the Roman building, the level of change is very moderate. It changes over time. Not like the white building, which is a federal budget of $200 million. The, empire, the emperor says, go there and build me a building. It changes gradually. And it changes in a level of technology and financial uh, expenditure, which is feasible for a group of families of Capernaum, which are banding together and forming some sort of a commune or kibbutz, if you will, post-crucifixion, immediately after the crucifixion. And this will correspond very well with my written testimony, which is the ends of Acts 2 and the ends of Acts 4, the way of life of the believer. Let's continue. I like to call this picture a great Jew paying homage to a great Jew. And as you know, in these very, very, very troubled time, the vision that our founding father, David Ben-Gurion, had for us is being endangered. Let's continue. This is not New Testament, but this item is found in Bethsaida, and it is biblical, and I thought it was very cool. You can see the image of Baal, a bull, and you can see the image of virility, if you will, between his leg, and the Baal who sat at the gate of the city in the Old Testament period is armed with a sword to be an imposing guardian for the city. Let's continue. This is uh, less New Testament. I just added some mints, if you will, for our end, as we have only seven minutes. Just day-to-day -day life in the Sea of Um Another image engraved Old Testament period of Baal. Uh, and a little joke to light things up. Do you know why my ancient ancestors worshipped a golden calf in Sinai? They were really interested in worshipping a golden bull, but they didn't have enough gold to create a bull, and they had to settle for a calf. And let's continue. This is my very good friend from my kibbutz. And we are currently the largest fishing company, the commercial fishing company in the Sea of Galilee. And those of you to wish to be fishermen of the Sea of Galilee, you will simply join the crewmen of my community fishing boat. And I think that will be a cool story to, say, to tell back home. I physically fished on the Sea of Galilee and hopefully travel and normal life will resume sooner rather than later. Let's continue a few. As you can see, the same fish, we added some more artificially, but you can see that the bounty of the Sea of Galilee is still with us until this very day. Shalabit, and let's, let's proceed. My very good friend Alon have uh, brought in the catch of the day. Very, very charming young man, and we wish him the best of luck on his upcoming marriage. And let's please continue. 
And the gentleman over here is the captain of our fishing boat. I must say the picture is quite old. The man lost quite a lot of weight. So when you come and visit the Galilee, we'll see a much skinnier version of this fellow. And this guy is 40 years of fisherman in the Sea of Galilee. He knows this place inside and outside. And David Suchet hired him for his documentary about the life of Christ in the disciples. And let's please continue. Last but certainly not least, this is not the original place of baptism. The actual place of baptism by John the Baptist was much more to the south, but this is in fact the River Jordan. And the Sea of Galilee has enjoyed, and the Jordan have enjoyed the most abundant year we remember. And in all of this horrible mess we are all going through right now, this is our beacon of hope. So were you to come, you will surely see the Galilee in its most beautiful form that it's been in years. And let's see the last slide. And you can see that this gentleman right over here is having a very profound spiritual ex experience in the land of the gospel. And thank you for your time. I was able to do everything within the time frame. If you have any questions, I'm very happy to address them. Idan, thank you very, very much for a wonderful, wonderful um, lecture. Even I learned a lot. And saying even indicates that I may have known something before, but, <laughs> but in any event, it was absolutely fascinating. And we do have, uh, if anybody has any questions. Uh, and guys, to... I want to tell you, in real life, it's a lot nicer than seeing the slideshow, I promise you. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so we have, uh, for example, uh, a question from uh, Joseph, who wants to know what evidence is there that uh, Jesus, uh, with uh, certainty, was in the temple in Magdala. Synagogue. This is from Joseph. The synagogue. Wonderful question, Joseph. I can't help but notice you have the Dome of the Rock there under your background. Um, how do I know this 100% sure, certain sure? Jesus ministered to these villages on a regular basis. Which means he ministered to Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, and Magdala. These are the vessels of the ministry. This is where he goes to minister. When he goes to the village on a Saturday, the congregation is convened in the synagogue. Which this is what it means in the Hebrew language, house we convene it, not a temple. Okay, the temple is where we sacrifice animals in Jerusalem. Completely and utterly different thing. It means Christ lectures in this synagogue, in this synagogue of Magdala, on a very regular basis for three years. Surely if he's been in this region, surely if he's a very popular country preacher, which is welcomed in every synagogue, and that is the only synagogue to exist in the town at the time frame, surely the chances he were not there are non-existent. And we have a very famous story of the woman who touched the cloth of Christ and was healed, which is probably exactly in that very building which we, we saw. Wonderful. <clears throat> All right. Does anybody have any other questions? Uh, let's see here. Yes, there is. There is. Okay. All right. Well, uh, uh, I'm an archaeologist. I'm not a theologian. There is a place, but as an archaeologist, I need to work with material evidence, which means I need a town. 
something like the Sermon of the Mount, for me as an archaeologist, is difficult, okay? Because people came, they heard a sermon, and when the sermon was over, they were miraculously fed, and then they went home. I come in, 2,000 years later, I find the home. Now I have something for work with. Now I have something I can gain information from. And the Bay of Parables is problematic because no one stayed there for long enough to leave anything for me to, to give you any insights. But I can take you to where the tradition says it is. Yes, 100%. Wonderful. So thank you all very, very much for joining us again from Milwaukee and from Jerusalem. I'd like to wish you a Shabbat Shalom. This uh, video will be available online. Uh, I'll be sending everybody a link and also putting it up on my uh, Facebook page. Um, if you're interested in, uh, in uh, further uh, lectures, uh, I think this one can be called a success, a success. We've had quite a few people join us. I was surprised by, by the number. And so uh, I'll be thinking about uh, other possibilities maybe for next week. Uh, so I'll put this on the Facebook page and please follow that page uh, for, for more information. Thank you all again for joining us. Idan, you've been absolutely magnificent. I miss you all very, very much. It's wonderful to see all these beautiful faces again that we all saw together under the uh, Mediterranean sunshine. And I'm looking forward to doing it again very, very soon. So be well, be healthy, uh, take good care of yourself. And uh, let me know by email uh, if there was anything else that we could have done that would have been better. Thank you again. Shalom, shalom, everybody. Shalom, and God bless you. And please, Lord, save us from this plague. <laughs>